Welcome! This is the Rustic Songbird Podcast, and I'm your host, Lydia Walker. This show is for you if you're ready to learn more about the craft of songwriting and take your skills to the next level. Thanks so much for listening. Let's get started. Today, my guest on the show is Alan Harvey. He is a member of the Blood Brothers Blues Group. It's a Christian blues group. He's been a songwriter for a long time. And he recently was part of a songwriting panel that we had at the CSMI Impact Conference. And I really appreciated how he broke down ideas into something simple that's easy to understand. And he explained those so well. So I asked Alan to be on the show to talk about one of our favorite topics, songwriting. So Alan, thanks for being on the show. Thank you for having me, Lydia. It's a, it's a privilege. I appreciate well, tell me a little bit about your background and how you got started in songwriting. Okay, well, it's an interesting story. I've been a musician, I guess you would say, all my life. I learned to play the guitar at 11, and uh, so when I do the math, that means I've been playing the guitar and singing for uh, 56 years. And But I was singing when I was little all the way up my father used to take me and my older sister to he was very active in a lot of political stuff and there were a lot of these meetings and he would take me to these meetings and have my sister play the piano and me sing songs that he liked you know the from way in the past and it was great fun for me I just automatically assume I should be in front of people singing that's just how I'm built but I'm also um a very uh focused on the idea of communication being so important. And so if you have a message that you want to bring to people, writing a song is an excellent way of doing it. Um, Also, when I was little, and I still do it, okay, the Blood Brothers have songs we call recovers, where we take a song that everybody's familiar with and change a lyric here and a lyric there and suddenly make it be biblical. Okay, I'm, cool. I'm very, it's very important to me that, that songs are biblically accurate. Yes. And uh, I even kind of have a pet peeve, you know, about some of the worship songs. I'm an active worship leader. I lead worship in two congregations pretty much okay. full time and do a lot of, well, like Caritas worship conference kind of mm-hmm. thing. In any case, I said all that to say this, these recovers get people's attention and then bring them truth and to me there's nothing more important than that and i've been doing that since i was little with with jingles from commercials i'd make up my own lyrics to them just Mm -hmm. so i would could laugh (laughs) so anyway that's my background awesome well that's a great exercise to take a song that's already been written or a song that's very familiar and Mm -hmm. change the lyrics to it because you learn so much about the format and how it's written how the rhyming structure works and then if it's a song that's popular then you can tell, well, this is what people are connecting to. Exactly. It really helps when you're writing your own original music because you have those things in mind and you can learn from the best. Right, right. And a lot of people get caught in a style, and we all develop a style, but I believe strongly, at least it's been my experience, that you, you develop your style from what you like. And I happen to have the privilege of having a whole range from bluegrass style music to rock that is not heavy metal. I'm not a big fan of that. Although the Blood Brothers second CD, we do have a heavy metal on. More classic rock or soft rock. Is that what you mean? Uh, Yeah. Let's put it this way. I grew up listening to uh, the Rolling Stones, Creedence Clearwater Revival, people like that. And okay. that influences my style a lot. Sure. But in 1979, after having been a professional musician for about a decade, okay, a little over, um, I gave my life to Christ. I stole a Bible from a hotel room and read it. <laughs> that's <laughs> and awesome. It, and then that's how God connected to me. And it's been a blessing ever since. And instantly, because I was already a musician, I was thrust into the world of Christian music. And it also instantly, songs came that just celebrated the joy I had in just knowing that God was real. You have to listen to what is going on in your life. You know, there are people who blog 
and there are people who write songs. Right. <laughs> and you're kind of doing both, God bless you. That's a great choice. <laughs> yeah, it's fun when you're a creative person, you can use different outlets to express your creativity. And so mm -hmm. music is a great one, I yeah. think. But there are so many other opportunities out there. And I know people that are kind of jack of all trades. They do a little bit of this and a little bit of that because uh, they are so creative and they're a little ADD where they can't just focus on one genre or one style or, you know, even just music in general, they uh, like to branch out. Exactly. So as creative people, we can be creative in lots of different ways. And as a writer, there are lots of writing opportunities, whether it's in a song or not. Right. My wife is currently engaged in this process where God is giving her stuff to write all the time. And she's just now working. She's collected a lot of material. She's just working on finding a place where people can um, hear it, where people yes. can, you know, read it, I should say. And yeah, I'm one of those ADHD people also. Of course, when I was a kid, they called it genius. Okay. And they didn't medicate <laughs> <for> it. <laughs> Well, that's Today. a better term for it anyway. Yes, that's what I think too. I mean, busy thinking about lots of things all at the same time and putting effort into doing the ones that are the most exciting. Yes. Well, I'd like to hear from your experience. You've been doing this a long time. Let's talk about the anatomy of a good song okay. and what that looks like when you break down the structure, um, when you have the music and the lyrics that just gel perfectly. What does that look like? Well. I think I started off talking a little bit about that. The music should bring about a feeling. I mean, many people have said, and I, I concur, that music is like the language of the soul. You're talking yeah. hearts or talking to hearts through music when there's no lyrics at all. However, since I've been involved in Christian music for 39 years, the message is important. So just writing things that bring people certain attitudes and moods and thought processes, heart feelings, okay, that's great, and you can do that. And I strongly encourage anybody who's a musician to learn as much as they can about music and practice a lot, <laughs> okay? Not just practice, practice trying to do different things and putting things together for the sake of just having the skill set. As you expand your skill set, you give God more tools to work with. And also, as you practice, you have to pay less attention to the mechanical part of playing the instrument. Right. And that frees your heart, soul, mind up to let God speak to you, let God speak through you. Now, I picked blues for two reasons when we did the blues thing. Now, again, I've been a worship leader for 39 years. I was a worship leader when they didn't call us worship leaders. I was playing uh, praise music when it was called CCM. Okay, some of us know about that. And the funniest thing I think of when I, when I contemplate that concept is that, uh, sorry, a bunch of big words. I like big words. I just try to keep I like it. big words too. <laughs> okay. I think that's part of being a songwriter. You just like words and their meanings and Absolutely. Um, how they sound together. Shame. Shades of meaning and the, the way a word makes you feel, those are important too. But anyway, they talked about CCM, Christian Contemporary Music, and I think it's hilarious because it's not contemporary at all anymore. <laughs> there were some awesome songs, okay, and I still play some of those wonderful, you know, Keith, I'm very sorry. I still play some of those awesome songs like by Keith Green and, and other people who wrote this stuff that moves you and it was deeply powerful and right and, and so, they were contemporary at the time at the time exactly that, that was a style now nowadays i don't think there is man somebody's i'm very sorry That's uh, okay. somebody's very interested in uh in uh well no i'm sorry let's rephrase that contemporary now is accepted i really apologize here and I'm pretty confident that that's a uh, salesperson trying to sell me something. <laughs> anyway, today, styles of all kinds are accepted. I love that, okay? We were at, at the Impact, the CSMI Impact meeting, and, you know, the range was all over the place. And it's God can be praised in so many ways because he is, you know, 
an infinitely faceted God who loves, who loves, and he loves that we're trying to do anything that blesses him. Anyway, back to the structure and construction and style and things of that nature. Just like you should be good at your instrument so that you don't have to pay too much attention to it. It's also really good to be a, a wordsmith, to have invested time in the understanding of language. And it does not have to be complex to be good. A lot of people miss that. And early on when you're songwriting, when you want to have something be complex. It makes you look good. You but, want to use all of your skills in one song. Exactly. All of the words exactly. That you know. <laughs> and and that's a, that's a, that can be a problem. You, it's not a shortcut to be as complex as possible. It is too many details. Usually you can actually take away from the message. And again, I, earlier I started to say this, and now I will continue to say this. When God pointed me towards Christian blues, which was something I didn't start doing until the 90s, I was a blues guitarist as a secular musician, along with rock, because, I mean, you know, everybody loves both those genres. And I had never, somebody asked me to play guitar in a Christian blues band. It was the first time in my life I'd ever heard those two words together. And I thought to myself, that's a vehicle. Because huh. when you... Listen to just standard blues songs that everybody knows. A lot of repetition, a lot of cliches. And cliches, everybody talks about them like they're a bad thing, but just like music that people are already familiar with. Right, you can use that. Exactly. So those sayings that are familiar to people, connected in the right kind of way, can easily convey a very simple but the, of course, the most important message, which is salvation through Christ. Right. And taking those cliches and really breaking it down to think, is this theologically correct? Is there a way I could explain what this really means or what mm -hmm. this can mean with scripture or even turn a phrase and have a double meaning? Yes. In the song. Like it does mean one thing, but it also could mean something else. And then use both of those perspectives. Absolutely, absolutely. I uh, this one of the songs that I played at the Impact Conference was one of the Blood Brothers Christian Blues song call, songs called "See the Light or Feel the Heat." Now, mm. can you get the gospel more simple than that? <laughs> That's awesome. Turn or burn. <laughs> exactly, exactly. Turn or burn. Yeah, I guess you can because you just did. But, uh, see the light or feel the heat, and I actually actively chose to use many, many cliches in that song, okay? Things that people would associate with going to heaven or not, okay? Yes. <laughs> because the point I was trying to make is, do we realize how important this decision is? Right. And, but saying it simply, saying it with music that makes you think. One of the things about blues music that a lot of people miss is it does make you think. It draws you in and it gives you, puts you in a mood to hear what somebody has to say. Right. And, and, and by the way, after some, of course, I'm a, I'm a geek. I'm a research addict. I guess that was what you'd call me. Um, Christian blues has been around a long, 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 long time. Actually, about half of the blues people that made it famous in the 20s and 30s, started out in church. And the reason it was called the devil's music was because they didn't, they were taking music that was often used in the church and using it to talk about sin. And so they were in rebellion and sin. Well, secular music often glorifies sin. That's uh, sad, but true, what we'd expect. But there are people like... Uh, Reverend Gary Davis and Robert T. Wilkins and uh, Mississippi Fred McDowell. And these guys all played songs that were biblical, that glorified God in a blues style. Mm -hmm. So it's, it's, it's a great genre for getting a point across. Okay, not that it's the only one, but it's a great one for that. Yeah, and it's a fun style. Like you said, it makes people comfortable, and if it's a familiar sound, they're more likely to receive the message of the song that they're hearing through the words. Exactly. And the bottom line here is simplicity can pay off. 
Yes. Again, you, whatever your style is, if you get too complex, now there's places for complex. I've written some songs that are beautiful songs that are musically complex. And uh, that the message that comes across in those songs has to, you have to be so good at your craft to know that what you're saying and the song, the song musically, its message matches what you have to say or, or undergirds or stresses the things you're saying. But that is much more difficult. And honestly, the better songs generally are not that complex in, in my experience. Right. Sometimes the simpler they are, the wider the audience because people will connect with it. Yes, Some of absolutely. the most beautiful um, compositions that are complex musically can only be appreciated by people who understand why it's complex and why it's working that way. Right. And the majority of listeners wouldn't even be able to tell the difference. But if they hear someone who's singing their heart out with three chords on a guitar and that's the only three chords they know, you know, sometimes more people will connect with that mm -hmm. because of the feeling instead of the complexity of it. So I agree. There's a quote, I'll have to find who said this, but perfection is achieved not when there's nothing more to add, but when there's nothing more you can take away. Yes. Yes. I really like that quote because it is important to really pull apart everything that's not necessary to find the real gold in that. Yes. Song. Yes. I, I totally agree with that. I have uh, been in a lot of recording studios in this somewhat long career. And uh, one of the things I often see displayed in a recording studio is it's what you don't play. Okay. That we, we all get anxious about showing off. We've learned our skills or what everybody know we're good. Okay. And that's, that has its place. And once in a while you have to uh, um, demonstrate that you can play. I mean, even if it's just for yourself to know that you're comfortable, but uh, when you make it complex, you make it harder. And when you make it harder, sometimes people are just, I, I don't want to listen to that. You know, mm -hmm. it's too much to think they can't enjoy it as much. Exactly. Mm -hmm. And now I love jazz and I love to play jazz and I have friends who are into that, but you know, most people really, unless they're musicians, either don't like jazz or just don't appreciate it to them. Oh, it's music. Yay. And <laughs> <laughs> you know, and I, I have a great life example of this. I am, um, I'm one of the rare guitarists who reads music. Okay. I was, uh, you know, if you ask Chet Atkins if he read music, he would say, not enough to hurt my playing. Okay, that's, <laughs> that's a common thing. But really and honestly, music, like sheet music, to the guitar is kind of like learning calculus in German because it's two very separate things. Sheet music is not really designed with what a guitar presents for you to use in mind. So you have to learn the music, and then you have to learn how to play the music on the guitar, okay? And because I decided to do that, it was a real blessing because it also gave me some great insight. Just like I got a degree in theology recently, master's degree, and uh, I didn't need it, but it gave me some wonderful insights. I learned some things that I never would have learned just reading the Bible over and over again, which has been mostly my... Uh, teaching process for myself. Um, but in any case, we, uh, they give you scores that the guitar player, if, when you're playing with an orchestra, they give you a score. People who write those scores don't play the guitar usually. And I cannot tell you, I've lost track of the number of times I've been given this score and they say, play this. And I say, okay. And then I go woodshed it out, learn to play it. And it's awful. I mean, it's just bad. And I would go back to the orchestra director and say, listen, I will play this because it's what you gave me, but listen. And he or she will go, oh, <laughs> you know, that's not good at all. And there's a reason for that. People who write scores play violins. They play trumpets. They play pianos. They don't play guitars. And so they don't have a grasp of what good guitar playing is. Now, that's not always true. You know, maybe three or four out of, or two or three out of 10 probably is a better average uh, of those scores. I actually have good guitar music in them. But usually after I've, 
I don't have the right to tell the director it's not good unless I can play it and he can hear it and say, oh, yeah. <laughs> so do what you think fits there. And so it's really interesting that how many times I've played with an orchestra with all that sheet music and I'm still improvising. <laughs> it's, right. And it's okay. It, that's that concept. You have to be good enough to recognize when you're making things too complex. Or you have to be good enough to recognize this song is not doing what I wanted it to do. And one of the main things that God put on my heart all in, in the songwriting process is step back and try not to be you while you listen to it. And it, step uh, back to look at it as the listener. Yes, exactly. Exactly. Just hear it, feel it. What does it do for you? you now that you're not thinking about, oh, I know what this next chord is and I know how this progression I've put together. And, and it's amazing. That's why it is helpful to do one of the things that was strongly encouraged at, at the Impact. I guess it was a conference. I, at yeah, Impact, the Impact Conference. It was, yeah. um, is co-writing, working with mm -hmm. other people. Other people will hear the things you're doing and not be so influenced by the ownership, you know, when we play a gig, for the Blood Brothers play a gig, we know how long we have to play, and we know how many songs will fit in that period of time. So then we, mostly me, um, pray about it, put together a song list, and for the songs to make it onto that list, they have to say what we want to say, they have to fit the audience to the best of our ability to understand that, they have to reach that audience. We have to feel like we're confident in them. And so you put together a song list and then you have to start killing your babies. Because you have to it take ends up being songs away from the list. Yeah. Yes. <laughs> it's like, really? I, I, I can't, I don't have time to play that. <laughs> oh no. But that's what you have to do. And, and to me, it's a matter of prayer. It, obviously, two to three times a week, I am also putting together worship sets for the, the churches that I lead worship at. And the same thing is involved. Only God knows what will work at a place or at a time where you're going. And so I suppose the most simple thing that a, that a person ought to have in their songwriting craft is the connection to God, to speak to him, to listen to him, to know, to have peace, to have an understanding. This is what God wants. And he has all the absolutely correct answers. And the closer we get to that, the better things become, obviously. So, Right. There's a lot that goes into building a set, and uh, there's only so much you can do. But I do believe that God will give you the discernment to pick the songs that people need to hear. And different songs will stand out to different people, depending on – their circumstances and what they're going through that week when they hear it on a Sunday morning, it might even be a song that they've heard tons of times, but it just means something different to them when they hear it in that context. Yes, exactly. Exactly. And again, just like I also preach or teach, I do a lot of teaching and some preaching. Um, only God knows what the group that's going to be there at the time needs to hear. Certainly we prepare. You know, I know guys who are preachers who will say, oh, yeah, God will give me a message when I get there. And, and I'm okay with shooting from the hip. As I long just, as you're prepared. Yeah, exactly. It's, it's cheating God. If I'm not prepared, then what am I doing here? You know, it's like he gave me these skills and tools. If I'm not using them, I'm, I feel like I'm letting him down, and I never want to do that. Right. Sometimes you have a plan, and then last minute you feel like, the Lord is leading you to change something and then you can be spontaneous and flexible within that plan. You can yes. say, okay, well, I was going to do this, but now because of this, we're going to change direction. And a lot of times the Lord will use that. Right. Right. You're willing and, to go uh, away from your structure. Yes. Yes. And actually that's a very important practice also in songwriting. You may be going a direction. I may be going a direction with a song, and have worked out all of the details. And then when I get to it, it's like, oh, I didn't see that. I didn't hear that. I didn't recognize that. I didn't know that. And that uh, we have to be open to that. If we're not open to that, 
I don't think we're really walking our walk like we should be because God has to have the free reign and right in our hearts, in our minds, in our lives to give us other instructions besides what we were comfortable with. I don't sometimes think comfortable is the enemy of usable. And so he'll stretch us. And I, and I like that. I just came back from a conference. Uh, I'm part of the Cal- Calvary Chapel movement. So a matter of fact, my minister's license is Calvary Chapel. Um, and every year we have a event called the Midwest pastors conference, which people from everywhere from, uh, West Virginia to Nebraska gather together at this place. And then we have some really great speakers. And one of the speakers was a pastor named Al James, who was at uh, Prescott, uh, Arizona, the lead pastor for 27 years. And then he stepped down. He wanted to retire. That was his plan. He had grandkids. He wanted to spend time with them, that kind of thing. And, uh, but God had other plans after he stepped down. He went to five different churches that had blown up. Uh, pastor did something horrific or pastor died or just there was some sort of death knell of that fellowship in process. And so he kept getting tapped to go, you go there, you go there, you go there. And, and he would go in each place, spend three months, five months, that kind of thing, and be used to do that. And he was trained to do that. Well, I said all that to say this. The second message that he gave us was so wonderful and so powerful that God gave us through him. And it was not at all what he prepared. Mm. He woke up in the middle of the night thinking, I'm teaching alongside of these amazing people like David Guzik and other folks like that who really know. He says, what am I doing here? I don't belong here. But he's always the guy to be prepared. He said, he gave in that morning to God and said, all right, what do you want me to do? And he literally, knowing God didn't want him to do what he prepared, got up and told us his really testimony over the last few years. And it was powerful and it had amazing things in it. The teaching was amazing. Mm -hmm. And so usually I think when God takes over, whether you're writing a song, teaching a message, uh, leading a worship set, okay, when God takes over, it's going to be better. <laughs> you know, right. I think he's smarter than me. I'm pretty sure. Well, I think that comes through the connection of prayer and really seeking God. And then just being op- open and humble enough to listen to the Holy Spirit. Because the Holy Spirit's voice is a still small voice. Yes. Amen. And the world around us is loud noise yes so, yes uh, when we're listening for the holy spirit we could miss it if we're not listening and paying attention and being humble enough to change our way of doing things yes exactly i i think the most dangerous thing in the body of christ is when people start to think they have their act together right we never really have it together do we <laughs> no. always learning there's always more i to learn. I, I i can say this with uh, some solidity okay 39 years i've been reading the bible studying it deeply 39 years i've been serving god in various ways 39 years and i have discovered that the more i learn the more i realize there's so much more i don't know and and god knows it all and i uh i think that's something that we have to keep back to songwriting because this is really supposed to be about songwriting and helping people i think it applies Yes, I do too. I mean, I think writing a sermon and writing a song are not that different. Okay. Right. You're still sharing a message, whether it's put to music or not. Exactly. And you have points to make and you have the needs of the people that you're speaking to. I, I never say the audience. I don't believe in that. I think that's wrong. I like to call the audience the choir. Because <laughs> sometimes we are preaching to the choir, aren't we? <laughs> yeah, exactly, exactly. I, I would like I like to be singing with the choir, okay? And that's that's the way I look at it. In any case, so let's shall we get back into the mechanics? What's your next question? I suppose I sure. Yeah, before we wrap up, I did want to give you the chance to just give an encouragement to any beginning songwriters or people that are getting started, or just learning or wanting to improve. What's your encouragement? I know it gets so discouraging because there are so many options out there and it takes a lot of time to practice and really perfect your craft. So what's your encouragement to writers that are 
just in the thick of it, getting started and learning. Okay. First of all, one plus God is a majority. And so if God has called you to write songs, then you've already won because he knows exactly what's right. Dependence on him is the most important thing we have. Like you said, Lydia, humility, okay? We should never think we have our act together. I taught guitar for a long time, but then I became a computer consultant and it's much more lucrative. Therefore, I have to spend less of my time making money so I have more time to serve God directly. Not that I'm not serving God with the word. But uh, when I was teaching students, I was surprised once I learned humility, how much my students could teach me. Hmm. Okay. That's true. People, we all have different thought processes. Always be open to learn. Uh, another, I'm trying to remember who it was. I think it's Eric, was Eric Clapton. One of, you know, one of the major guitar players that everybody knows said the best musicians are the ones who have stolen the most licks. Always pay attention to what somebody else is playing because they may be doing something that would really work for you. Don't ever think you've arrived. Know that God has the ultimate right answer for everything you're doing. Do your best to listen to the still, small voice. Quiet the racket in your head. Get the Bible inside of you. If you're doing this for Jesus, you want to make sure. I mean, I have, um, I told you I have a pet peeve. And this pet peeve is that worship songs sometimes say things that are not biblical at all. Right. It's so important to double and triple check that. Exactly. Exactly. Like, and if my God is with me, okay, if... I think it should say since because God is on my side. I think he's proven that quite well, but sometimes wording like that brings a flavor, but be aware or uh, in all I do, I honor you. I can't tell you I've ever gone an hour and have everything I do honor God. I wish that were true. So pay attention to what the word says, but listen to the spirit also and let him remind you you'll know when something's wrong and uh, again it does not have to be complex to be good but hone your craft the better you are at your instrument the less attention you have to pay to that while you're singing and playing as a person who sings and plays i know that the far more complex instrument is the voice and it takes people like celine dion or barbara streisand or whatever as much as I don't necessarily agree with their, you know, opinions, you know, I, there's a book out there that uh, written to Barbara Streisand that says, shut up and sing. Okay. <laughs> it's like, Britain has the p- same opinion of me when I tell jokes. She's like, okay, quit talk, less talking, more singing, honey. But the point is that our vocal instrument is also, if we're going to be a songwriter, singer, songwriter, Put as much effort into learning your tool there, that skill there. And it's complex. So if you're just barely remembering or getting the chords right, you don't have enough attention to pay to the vocals. And if you're singing flat or something like that, you're robbing God. So be careful about those things. Try to just get as good as you can at your craft. Yes, it's important to be excellent as much as we can and to really do our best when we are playing for the Lord. Thank you for sharing with us today and sharing from your experience. I really Mm -hmm. appreciate you taking the time. I did want to tell our listeners how they can get connected with you. Alan Harvey is a member of the Blood Brothers Blues Group, Christian Blues Group, and their website is bloodbrothers.com. That's spelled B-L-U-D-B-R-O-S.com. I'll link that in the show description as well. So thank you. Are there any final thoughts you'd like to share? Yes, yes, there is. There is one, okay, and that is that if you, uh, when I gave my life to Christ from stealing the Bible at a hotel room and reading it, okay, one of the mistakes I made, but it's been a good mistake, God wastes nothing, was I made a vow to God that I would be part of some of the most beautiful music he's ever heard. Now, that's a little bombastic, but I didn't know better at that point in my I wasn't even a Christian yet. I was just reading the Bible. I started at Genesis, okay, and read all the way through. That was hard. took nine months, regardless. Um, Over my walk, I've 
continuously, I am continuously learning what God means when I say that, the most beautiful music that God's heard. And it could be a six-year-old singing Jesus Loves Me monotone. The important thing is our hearts being drawn closer to God. The goal of everything I do musically, and I would encourage everybody else in the same way, is what you're doing, bringing hearts closer to God. That's what God finds beautiful. That's wonderful. Thank you for sharing that. I appreciate you uh, you being willing to be on the show today. And I've gotten so much out of it. So thank you uh, for taking the time and being here with us. All right. Thank you, Lydia. God bless you. If you enjoyed this episode, be sure to subscribe, rate, and review this podcast and share it with a fellow writer. Thank you so much for listening. I'll talk to you in the next episode.